Hello everyone, welcome to Hauser & Wirth. I'm Russell Salmon, Events Manager here at the Gallery, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today for a conversation about Brazilian artist Ligia Pape's rarely seen Tupanamba series with Hammer Chief Curator Connie Butler and independent curator and researcher Julieta Gonzalez, who is joining us today from Mexico City. Ligia Pape Tupanamba, the artist's first ever solo exhibition in Los Angeles, will be on view until August 1st. So if you are in the area, I strongly encourage you to come down to the gallery and see these vibrant works in person. Today's digital event will be closed captioned. If you'd like to utilize this function, simply click the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Connie and Julieta will take questions at the end of the event. If you would like to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A icon. Thank you again for joining us today. And now it is my true pleasure and honor to introduce you to Connie Butler and Julieta Gonzalez. Hi, Julieta. Hi, hello, Connie. How are you? Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. I'm. Uh, I want to thank, start us off, I guess, by thanking Russell Salmon and uh, Hauser and Worth, of course, um, as well as acknowledging Olivier Renaud Clément, who's the the curator of the beautiful show at Hauser and Worth, and I also urge everyone to see it before August. I'm also so honored to be in dialogue with you, Julieta, as a long admirer of your work. Um, I guess I'm gonna maybe start us off a little bit with um, some thoughts about Ligia Pape's work um, as we've seen it in Los Angeles, which there have been a few rare opportunities to do, um, and then kind of set up the video walkthrough that we'll see um, and that will take us into conversation and other images from her work. Um, as far as I can track, uh, there have been three other times specifically that it's been possible to see Pape's work here in LA. Um, the first, I think, was in the Out of Actions exhibition curated by Paul Schimmel at MOCA in 1998. And um, Pape, I remember meeting her at that time. She was alive, very much so, and came for the installation. And she showed at that time the Rota dos, dos Prazeres, uh, the Wheel of Pleasures from 1967, which is this beautiful installation of a circle of bowls of um, colored liquid, which the public is able to, through droppers, to actually taste and experience. So this kind of synesthetic notion of the, the tasting and bringing into the body of color um, is enacted in that beautiful piece. Um, and then in Revolution in the Making, the exhibition that opened Hauser and Wirth, uh, the Titea number one <clears throat> was shown. And then most recently in the Radical Women exhibition in 2017, which was at the Hammer, um, it was the same year that Pape had her retrospective exhibition at the Met Breuer. Um, and, but at the Hammer, we showed Eat Me, which is um, a video from 1975. And uh, the, so just a few words, I, I made a few notes, so bear with me as I read from them um, about the exhibition. The, the show was called Radical Women, Latin American Women, uh, 1960 to 85, and it was curated by Cecilia Fajardo Hill and Andrea Junta. And it was an archival and deeply researched exhibition of about 120 artists. Um, Pape's film, <clears throat> excuse me, Eat Me, appeared at the end of the show and was a kind of uh, large projection on the wall, a beacon of strangeness, I, I thought, in this section that was devoted at the, at the end of the exhibition to the erotic as subject. She shared the space, a, a kind of small gallery, with artists like Marta Minuhin, Mercedes Elena, Elena Gonzalez, Karen Lamassone, Celia Sanchez, Marcia X, and others, as well as her close colleague, Ligia Clark, who was represented by the video Memoria del Corpo, which is the memory of the body. So on opposite sides of this gallery, you had the large projection of Pape's film with the mouths of two men enlarged to the point of the grotesque, and on the opposite wall, a video of uh, by Clark performing her therapeutic work with the therapeutic objects applied directly to the body of her male subjects. And now, as I look back on it, I can only think of it as these sort of images of um, the domestic, quiet images in the gallery surrounded by um, these dueling videos of the male body as the agent somehow and container of psychic and historical violence even. 
But Pape's film, Eat Me, uh, as I said, shows a shot of the mouths of these two men, um, fellow artists Artur Barrio and Claudio Sampao. Um, the camera is static and the film speeds up and slows down as the mouths swallow and spit out various objects. Um, we see here the allusion to the Brazilian concept of anthropophagy, which we're going to talk about uh, on the other side with the images, and the idea of um, the devouring of the other to absorb energy, a metaphor also for the political situation in Brazil under dictatorship at the time, a population under restrictive and deadly rule of careless uh, and ruthless men, one could say. Um, there's also no way not to read it as humorous, I think, that particular video. So just a few notes about kind of Pape's history that take us up to these two um, amazing installations that we'll see images of in a moment um, that are in the show at Hauser & Wirth. Her earliest affiliation as an artist was with the Grupo Frente, um, which was an avant-garde uh, group and practice that coalesced in Rio, Rio de Janeiro and was active from 52 to 64. Um, and she formed that group with Ligia Clark and uh, Elio Odisica. They practiced a geometric art that would allow for phenomenological and corporeal experience. While her peers were committed to painting as the medium for their experiment, Pape chose woodblock uh, prints, which we'll see in a moment, rather than painting. Um, and this was her primary practice during these years. Her beautiful book of creation from 59 became one of the iconic works of neoconcretism. In the late 50s, she began to experiment with performance and created the Neo Concrete Ballet in 1958, in which dancers inhabited costumes, these kind of shapes, architectonic shapes, as they moved about the stage. And in the 1960s, she worked with the film group Cinema Novo as a designer of posters and displays, which I think Julieta is going to speak to um, a little later as well. After the coup in Brazil in 64, um, during the dictatorship, she devoted herself to film during these years, and that's the time in which she made Eat Me uh, by the mid 70s. Her late career was devoted to large environmental installations and site specific works centering on the participation of the viewer and often investigating through abstraction, social and political themes. Um, I found a, a quote that Oidesika wrote of sort of talking about the strange link that he felt there was, um, he said in 1969, between all the different media that she uses. And I think that's one really interesting thing that maybe we can talk about is that she moves from the early woodblock prints, um, the tesselaris, as she would call them. And then we see at the end of her career, uh, the end of her power as an artist on, on view in the Hauser show, um, where still she's creating a kind of webbing and weaving of imagery. Um, <clears throat> she shares this, I think, breadth um, with other artists like Ligia Clark, uh, active at the time, and artists like Sonia Andrade, who's another Brazilian artist still working in Rio, um, much too little known, but a peer of hers. So the project at Hauser, um, the two projects at Hauser, but I'll speak about the one um, called Tetea, um, began as a series of nets initially her idea nets between trees for children's play. And I'm interested in this kind of embedding of the social and of play within the structure of a monumental abstract work. Um, she talks about the weaving of space um, and uh, the relinquishing of the beholder's identity through these, the kind of breaking of the figure ground binary. So um, the, I, I told Julieta that I find the installation, I found the installation at Hauser kind of shocking. The, the <laughs> Uh, the this body of work that I didn't know at all from 2004. It's right in her last years of production. Um, she uh, so there are two very different kinds of practice I would say represented at the in the gallery exhibition um, during this last five years or so of her production. The Tatia sculpture, which is this large abstraction made with wire, and the raw, wild and kind of raw bodily vision of the Tupinamba uh, installation that you'll see. Um, the description of the installation I noticed on the website is sailcloth metal poles, 190 polystyrene balls covered with red feathers, silicon bones, plastic cockroaches, and scorpion, which is a great list of media, I think. She was enthralled at this time with her two lives, according to Guy Brett, these two kind of this polarity within her own body of work. Um, and she also wrote to him at the time about um, the work that she was doing with uh, the Amazonian Indians. And it's this relationship specifically 
um, that informs very much this work, which is all about um, indigeneity and um, and the red feather mantle as an indigenous symbol of power. So maybe we can, with that, we can go into the, the video walkthrough of the installation and then we'll talk on the other side. And maybe we can start um, by kind of addressing the, the concept of the anthropophagic, the, the Tupinamba, the title of the installation is the name, as I understand it, of, of the native people, um, the Indians who lived on the coast of Brazil before European colonization. And um, uh, yeah, in your really wonderful text, which I guess is for, forthcoming called Savage Thought, you you talk about um, this idea of, a, of the anthropophagic and, and how, I mean, it's, it's everything in this installation. So maybe you can start by talking about that. Uh, yes. Um, so um, for me, um, it, this work also um, is a work that I've, I haven't seen much of. And, I really miss not seeing the installation with the, the large Tupinamba installation. I've seen other works. Um, and uh, for me to write this also was uh, an opportunity to understand this um, anthropophagic inflection that runs through, through Lija Pape's work. And that basically also runs through a lot of Brazilian art since the Manifesto Antropofago in, in 1928. But, um, what I think is interesting is how this trope of anthropophagy has informed, but also been reinterpreted successively. And uh, Lija is part of a generation that reinterpreted it in the context of this rhetoric, uh, uh, sorry, against the rhetoric of developmentalism, of um, posing an act of resistance to to this renewal of the colonialist project. As Mario Pedrosa said in, in his text, on his letter to the Tupiniquins Unambas, he says that developmentalism or this idea of, the, of taking Latin America towards development was the bar that sustained the colonial spirit. And Lija Pape actually talks about that and she reiteratedly mentions Pedrosa's uh, discourse um, in her thesis, Katiti Katiti, which was her master's thesis, which she wrote in the early 80s, which I also think is a sort of blueprint for her thought. Uh, it doesn't so much speak about her work, but about the context of her work and her peers and, and, and what Brazil was going through at the time. So Lija Pape was super invested in, 
in thinking around these social problems very much beyond the space of our history and the, sp and the gallery space and the museum space. So even though working formally, because, well, she's an artist and she's working with her sensibility, she was very much attuned to what was happening around her. And, and this is very evident in, in her writings. So when, the, um, um, when Oiticica organizes the Nova Objetividade Brasileira in 1967, the show he did at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio, uh, he calls for a super anthropophagy. So to reprise this idea of anthropophagy, but sort of ramp it up a little bit, no? And to make it more potent because now more than ever, this resistance was urgent on behalf of the artist. And we see that Lija is very, how would I say, um, very, uh, how, um, sort of akin to this spirit. She's very solidary with this idea. And she actually, what she presents at this show is a box with cockroaches. So and this box with cockroaches laid out very orderly in this very pristine plexiglass box is what she has to say about Brazil at that time, you know? And uh, I, I think that was a very, very potent message. And then, you know, uh, in another, uh, work that she presents, the piece of meat being eaten by the ants. So she's really taking that notion of sex, uh, a super anthropophagy to another level, to a level also of violence, of objection, of really saying, well, the picture of Brazil as, the, as you know, the gleaming white new buildings of Brasilia is not what it is. There, this is a country full of contradictions, full of violence. And I think she embodies a lot of what Glauber Rocha, you know, oh, his discourse on violence, um, Glauber Rocha, the filmmaker, sorry, what he meant, you know, when he called for this aesthetics of hunger. So that's something that, that I, this is a renewal. And then when she comes back, when she does this work at the very end of her life, it's coming back to that. And again, giving a new reading that really transcends this idea of the underdeveloped as a, an oppressed subject, the colonial subject as a subaltern subject, but really um, saying, no, if we, if we find these affinities with the indigenous mind, with this cannibalistic impulse, with this idea of uh, eating up the other in order to incorporate it, then, uh, there is um, there is a new power to that, and I think this is what is mo mostly evident in these works. You know what I what I didn't realize, which is this is my own lack, <laughs> is uh, when I was when I was reading around, just preparing a bit for today, is that I. I had remembered that the anthropophagic starts with the text of Andrade in 27 or when 1927, I think 26, but, but with the more metaphoric idea of the, you know, of the European colonial culture and the indigenous culture, but, but I had kind of forgotten, I guess, that it was actually a practice of, of the indigenous people, the actual ingestion of, you know, eating of the enemy to absorb the power of the enemy, which is so interesting. So it's a, it's a kind of, um, yeah, there's the original act of that, and then the reinterpretation, and and uh, then through to the super anthropophagic idea of Oedesica. I had I had forgotten that history, which is so interesting. Yes. and I think it comes into Katiti Katiti the film, right? Because the film is is just this rough, raw act of eating too. I think we have a clip here. We yes. maybe we want to show that in a moment.
I was just going to say maybe holding on this still because this brings in, of course, Duchamp, who's who's, as you said, present there in the chess game, but there also is an image of him in the film. So it's a little the film kind of lays out so many of the things that run through all of her work, don't you think? Absolutely. Uh, I think that the inclusion of this film in the show gives the key to understanding this very strange body of work that she produced at the end of her life. And that doesn't seem to make any sense, you know, with what we would normally associate Lija Pape with. So that's very interesting because to have this work, it's sort of that blueprint of this anthropophagic inflection. For on the first hand, actually the the um, most of the script, what, what we hear in the, in the film is actually the letter that Pedro Vaz de Caminha wrote to the, to the King of Portugal upon landing in Brazil and disembarking there and his encounter with the Tupinamba. And so, but she's also juxtaposing it with these images from, um, we see like, the um, transnational corporations like the ESO that we see, or then when we see the naked girls walking around the Panema beach, they're the objects of seduction. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's also has a lot of sense of humor, you know, when she's talking about these things. And, and I love the Duchamp because she takes clips from uh, Entracte, the film by René Claire. And um, so she, she plays this chess game, but there are so many clues embedded in this. As you were, we were talking before about the presence of Tarsila. Yeah. That, yeah. It's yeah. Only in the yeah. Yeah, it's just in the credits of the film and she has in the graphic a kind of that image of Tarsila, the woman's body, the yeah. indigenous woman's body kind of blended with the landscape that becomes the mountains of Rio, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, there's a title of the game, a chess game in the palm trees, but then in the palm trees is the land of Pindorama, which is the matriarchy that, um, that the Andrade speaks of in the Anthropophagic Manifesto. So I think she's including so many layers to be read in that film uh, from, and of course the, the role played by Duchamp because he is Bishop yeah. Sardinia who had this unfortunate name because he's really Bishop Sardine. And then we see a part of the film in which this character eats up the sardine and says, oh Jesus, the bishop is boiling. <laughs> <laughs> when he's eating the sardine. So there are many puns. This is like the idea of also um, the deglutition of, of a modern tr European tradition. And then this, uh, the way it comes back, you know, with this violence, with this sort of also idea of very raw poverty and, but also a very yeah. visceral um, relation with the, of the body to eating, to, to everything in the end, to earth, to dirt, to the idea of place. So, so I think it's, a, I think it's, a, a, this work is fantastic and it really, sets the tone that one and and then eat me yeah he's just a, a couple of years later right yeah so this is a still from the film that i was describing that we had in the radical women exhibition that that focuses on the mouths these two mouths that are ingesting and then spitting out um these objects <laughs> yeah um maybe we could go to an image of the um some of the objects that are in the show, like the the box with the breasts, mm -hmm. um, or one of the other objects, because one of the things that I, I found so that I initially didn't understand completely at all was the was the inclusion of these these feathered objects, these everyday household objects of furniture, and um, like here the box that are covered with red feathers, um, and then parts of bodies, including many breasts are added to the to the different um, objects. And this one in particular made me, th and, and this one too made me think of Duchamp, of course, but can you talk a little bit about how you understand these, these pieces of furniture and different objects that she's using? Well, see this throne um, really rem reminds me of the image I have in my background <laughs> that I put especially mm -hmm. for this talk because it's an engraving 
with uh, a Tupinamba person wearing one of these capes. And uh, what is interesting as well is that these capes, uh, I don't think there are any in Brazil anymore. They, they were very prized as objects for cabinets of curiosity and museums. And also the fact that she's reprising it and then that it shows up in different guises, like a ghostly sort of cloud over the, the Bay of Rio or in, as a cape, a ghostly cape as well when she's waiting for the bus. Um, she's talking of this indigenous memory that has been more sort of erased. But then she's also talking about this incorporation of the eat, the, the, the devourer and the devoured in one single thing. And, and, and of these kind of very fantastical beings that can arise from, from this savage thought, so to speak, a savage undomesticated thought, a liberated thought that thinks about the body, but thinks also about this hybridity as something that is necessary to produce um, another type of discourse, you know, a, 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 or a very visceral kind of art. So I find that this just that juxtaposition very interesting as well, because it's very violent, but on the other hand, it's also speaking, she's also cannibalizing these um, everyday domestic westernized objects, so to speak. Yeah. And incorporating them to that like um, to this indigenous universe that she's speaking about. Yeah, and almost making them disappear, right? In a kind of camouflaging with the red, the red cape. Yeah, that's what I that's what I understand too. Is that the red capes are no longer in Brazil at all? They're in European museums. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a kind of ghost image or something of the of the history. Can we go to um, maybe one of the overall installation shots of the large piece in the center of the room? The, um, I was sort of struck by, I mean, what's hard to see here in this um, dark picture is there's very much a kind of upper and lower register of this installation. You know, there's the, the feather balls uh, in this kind of, uh, yeah, canopy. And then underneath are, um, <laughs> which I didn't see the first time I, went to the show, surprising, but are these balls that are also covered with the cockroaches. So there's this, there's a kind, and although the feather balls have the body parts sticking out of them, as you can see there in this image, there's a foot and a, you know, a hand and different things that are kind of being cannibalized by the red feathered balls. Um, but on the other hand, on the other hand, on the underside are these, are these cockroaches. And it made me think of this, um, there's a passage in, I can't remember which book of uh, Clarice Lispector's, but I was reading it at the time of working on Legia Clark, but there's a, a part where she, she talks about this, you know, a cockroach coming out of the armoire in her bedroom. And it's this kind of crazy hallucination about the cockroach, but the cockroach is clearly a, a very important um, sort of symbol, right? Of, of the indigenous, but also somehow of the, I almost feel of the underworld or something. The, the way, again, there's this sort of upper and lower register implied here. Well, unfortunately, I've never been able to see the piece, so that I didn't know about these cockroach balls, you know, under the, um, and, and the, I think it provides a fascinating link to that first box of cockroaches that she presented in 1967 at the New Objectivity Show in, in Rio. And, but also, as you were rightly saying, I always thought of the, that cockroach box as elusive to, to Clarice Lispector's um, novel, mm. GH. And yes, with a woman, actually, she, she swallows the cockroach. Yeah. So it's again an act of swallowing something, of eating up. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought of that as the opposite of Kafka's metamorphosis, in which Kafka becomes. Mm -hmm. This insect, but here the woman just swallows it, you know, and then yeah. this generates this whole sort of mind journey in 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 her, and, and journey of introspection. Uh, so so yeah, I've always it's good that you make that relation because I always thought it was a very far fetched reading of that work, but I always thought about Clarice Respector's uh, cockroach. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's, yeah. I think it has to be there somehow. But also yeah. I wondered if there's some kind of religious, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, you know, relating to the, um, the colonizers or something that the, if, again, this kind of almost heaven and hell feeling of the, the way the installation is presented and structured. But I don't know if that's an overreading of it. No, who knows? I mean, I, I really um, can't say because I haven't seen this work and this is, you know, yeah. <laughs> in person. I just seen the photographs and it was, you know, hard to make out, but from that. And, and the pieces, because in I had been to Paula Pape's house in Rio a long time ago, and she showed me the balls and uh, images of this. And yeah. And I find it fascinating because those balls with the limbs coming out and their blood streaked and everything really give this image of, of the anthropophagus, you know. But it's a beautiful image as well because it's a hybrid being as well. It's this thing that is becoming, it's no longer human, but it's not animal and it's- That's interesting. It, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's true. They're all kind of in a state of mm -hmm. either being swallowed or of breaking out too. Exactly. Which ball. is that liminal state that she explores in Uovo. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Do we have a clip of Uovo? I think we do. Yeah, it's such a such a beautiful film. Yeah, and there we see that this work, for example, was fascinating for Oitisika. I mean, he he wrote extensively on it, saying well, it was one of the most radical propositions that he had encountered, and and he comes up with this entire lexicon of of names or or definitions for for this work because he says it's a shelter, it's borderline, it's a filter experience, it's a participant object environment, a core problem, transformation passage. And I think these are also the operations that very that define Lija Pape's work in, 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 in many ways. And I think they're reprised again albeit in, in a more representational terrain with these uh, Tupinamba works. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you, you know, I was thinking about some of her peers and her, her interest in the indigenous um, and work with indigenous peoples. And, you know, thinking that, I mean, of course, Odesika too, but for the most part, I think of I think of women artists as being the ones who have this kind of more direct engagement and the the influence of the indigenous populations coming kind of coming directly into their work. And I wondered, I mean, I was thinking of Annabella Geiger and um, you know other other of their peers and and Ligia. Uh, I think it's there, but it's it's a little more. Um, it's a little more deeply obscured in her work, I think. But I wonder if you think that's something that. Um, is, I don't know, a through line for some of the women coming out of the avant-garde of the 1960s, of the women artists in particular. Because um, I think that, I guess I was thinking of this notion of, you know, art into life and the collaboration of, you know, in the social realm. I think of that as being a legacy of women artists from the 1970s, certainly, and a feminist practice. Um, and I just wondered if you think that's something common to these women in particular. Well, it's, it's uh, interesting that, for example, Annabella Geiger produced her Brazil Nachivo, Brazil Arianesiana series in the mid 70s, more or less at the time that also um, uh, Lija Pape was uh, produced her, her film, uh, Our Parents Fossilis, which partakes of a similar operation with taking these postcards of the Amazonian and, uh, and indigenous tribes that circulated as sort of touristic um, objects, you know, trinkets in, 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 in Brazil. But I must say that in Venezuela, where I grew up too, you know, everywhere you would go that there was this tourist um, 
you, uh, how would I say, shop or anything about Venezuela, you would have photographs of the Amazonian tribes. In Venezuela, it was the Yanomami and the Yequana, Maquiritare. In, in Brazil, you have a bigger portion of the Amazon, so you have different other tribes. And, um, and, and these images did circulate as postcards, as postcards of, of the countries. And, but also she's at the time uh, in the 70s and she's so close to Mario Pedrosa as well. She was working with him on the organization of a show of, um, of the Brazilian Indian called the, uh, the Joy of Living, the Joy of Creating at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio. Uh -huh. in 1978 and this was an exhibition that would focus on the Brazilian Indian but on a, from an aesthetic perspective not uh, not the presentation of objects through the lens of anthropo anthropological representation so this was really a turn you know in terms of the consideration of these objects more for their aesthetic qualities than just presenting them as cultural ethnographic artifact. So um, the show unfortunately could never be done because it was scheduled to be presented at Mam Rio and the fire uh, that almost destroyed the museum led to the cancellation of the exhibition. But you see that again, this is what also always fascinated me about Lija Pape is her acute awareness of the context, her acute awareness of what's going on in Brazil, the acute awareness of what, how the, the indigenous are being really uh, ex extracted from their territory, their territory is polluted. And, and this is a crisis that we have seen has really intensified in the past years. And with Bolsonaro, well, what can I say? I mean, the guy, is threatening yeah. to burn down most of the Amazon. So I think she was very much, she had these concerns and she was voicing them. And I think the Manto Tupinamba, the moment in which she does this body of work is really a, a turning point as well in terms of, of how we think of the indigenous today. And, um, and this is what I think is so interesting about the work is that even precedes a lot of this theory. For example, um, um, anthropology has gone through this sort of act of um, contrition in a way for its role in the, in the colonial enterprise. And since the 1960s, it's been questioning itself, questioning uh, the ethnographic gaze, questioning the way these representations of the other are constructed. And, uh, but then an anthropologist like Viveiros de Castro, who also theoretically is so close to Bruno Latour, but also to Deleuze and Guattari, uh, he's really um, uh, delved in, in, into this idea of the indigenous mind and, and how the, we must think of them from their perspective. Amerindians yeah. uh, uh, approach the world from the idea of the body as as the producer of knowledge and the and the the body as the organ that apprehends the knowledge that there are no dualities there are no distinctions between nature and culture between the body and the soul and and i think she's anticipating this body of theory in a way with with these works that's so, so interesting yeah can we go back to a yeah a couple more images from the installation? Very funny too, I think. She has a lot a, a sense of humor always, I think, as well. I mean, yeah. it's not a work, you know, that is very serious and you know dramatic i think there's always this sort of tongue in cheek yeah which is very present in the in the film in in katiti katiti maybe we can go to the um to the images which uh are in some of her first works the um that we mentioned at the beginning the woodcuts um, because I think we wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of the weaving 
Um, but also you were mentioning the connection between these, these works, the woodcuts and her, her later interest in film in terms of kind of light and dark. Um, so these were, uh, when I was mentioning in the beginning that she, when, when she was working with the group of Frente that she uh, was working almost exclusively, I, I think in, in printmaking and not in painting actually. And that, but that very soon you see this interest in light and dark, but also a kind of movement, I think, that starts to happen in these um, that then take her into the late or get picked up, I guess, in her later interest in film. Yeah, and it's a more organic work as well, where you can almost sense, you know, that wood uh, in yeah. the texture of the wood. But she's also thinking about the tradition of uh, folk art from the northeast of Brazil, you know, uh, which is basically uh, woodcuts, but she's also thinking of artists like, um, oh God, now I, I just forgot the name, <laughs> um, that she actually collected. She did a little film on him, uh, and now I just forgot his name, but it will come in a few seconds. <laughs> and uh, who was a very important Brazilian engraver. And, um, and I think that uh, Ligia is trying to, to convey this more, or she's, um, how would I say, uh, returning the gesture to this idea of concrete art and the concrete art that was, so, you know, this geometric, very precise, uh, work and, and rendering a little bit, you know, textural, uh, organic, but also she has a text in which she says, um, okay, Osvaldo Goldi is the, ah, okay, braver. <laughs> sorry, it just comes back at the wrong time. <laughs> and, um, but also she's thinking about this idea, very, a very cinematic image that she's creating there. And ah. for her, to produce light, trying to darken things because this is the inverse process when, when you engrave, then she was thinking a lot about the film image. And, and then she decides to work with a lot of filmmakers in the, mid, in the early to mid sixties from documentary filmmakers like the Caravana Farcas, like Paulo Gil Suarez, um, but also the um, filmmakers from the Cinema Novo movement from Claudia Rocha and others. So, so we see she's totally accompanying this movement as well, which sought to also show the, the realities of this Brazil that was not the modern Brazil that Brasilia aimed to paint, you know, in a way. Yeah. And then, I mean, then these two, I think, are ha have in them the origin of the of the later. Uh, kind of wire installations too. I mean, at a very literal level of sort of the process of weavings in space, you know, that these lines then become the um, the lines of the wires that construct these um, tateas. I think one of the things that when you when you see these things, they're they're so elegant and so beautiful um, and always lit very theatrically, which I guess was her intention, must have been her intention. But when you get up close to them, they really are, um, they're so handmade, actually. They're just really, it's almost like a child's game, the way the wires are sort of, you know, held in place with the nails and woven into one another and into space. Um, I mean, I, I, I do find them very, um, you know, particularly because of their scale, that this idea that she had of drawing in the viewer, that she saw them as kind of participatory, seems... Um, to really be true. I mean, they at first appear very austere, but in fact, they're quite engaging, I think. And it's interesting that she reprises, you know, uh, uh, formal and, and visual research that she's doing in the late 50s, again, at the end of her life. And it's more or less the same time that she's producing these Tupinamba works. It's a uh, yeah, many yeah. things going on in her head, you know, at that moment. I, I wish I could have talked to her at that time and met her. Oh, I know. <laughs> because I, I, I think I'm, a, I'm supposed to ask for questions at this point. So sorry to interrupt, but just if people do want to, just to remind you again, if you do want to put questions into the chat uh, or into the Q&A, um, 
we invite you to do that. Otherwise, we'll just keep going. Yeah, I mean, this one is so amazing. What do you what do you know about the um, her choice of this kind of metallic thread, the golden thread, and then in other cases, it's just silver, right? Yes, but really, it's not a work that I've researched intensively. Um, so I, I don't really know about that uh, of, of material, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Also, it, it's very different in, in this idea of the silver and the gold uh, from, from other works in which she's um, the materiality is much more, how would I say, earthy and uh, more visceral. But I guess also, I don't know, I, this is a, now a crazy interpretation I'm making here, you know, the gold and silver that were the object of desire of the colonial. Um, uh -huh. But you know, this is something she's always thinking about the colonial enterprise. It's something that she writes about constantly. And I mean, in her thesis, it's very present. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't think it's beyond her to think of that. And then you have Sildo Meireles, more or less at the same time, well, a little earlier doing Misao Misoish, which is a work in which he has the bones and the, co the coins, you know? So he's thinking about this, also this relation of wealth and death, you know, as, as the two hallmarks of the colonial enterprise. Yeah, uh, I so, don't think it's too far-fetched at all. I mean, there also is something very intimidating about these big columns of gold. I mean, they're beautiful, but they're also, uh, yeah, there's something a little um, scary about them too, in a way, in the same way, yeah. There's that duality. We do have a couple um, questions I see. One is, um, could you speak about the works that were on the walls in the exhibition, the tiny photos and drawings on graph paper? Yeah, and I know, Julieta, you haven't really seen them there. And I couldn't tell when I was looking closely at them in the show, and obviously the dating of them is a little bit all over the place. So they're not specifically from Katiti Katiti. They're, mm -hmm. they're um, but they are little film stills. So I don't, I don't actually know anything about them. Well, these were a discovery for me. I didn't know them and they sent them to me in the, in the checklist and uh, they're later than the films. So actually she's um, re-elaborating on them and um, using stills from different films. So from Espacios y Mantados, which is also a wonderful work where she was fascinated by how people would kind of gather in the in public space around a, a street vendor or someone doing the street performance. And, and this person became like a sort of people magnet and created this circle around them. So she was fascinated by this idea of this magnetized space that came from this, um, how would I say, crowd turning into a multitude because it was an attentive crowd. It was, and I think also this has to do a lot with uh, the dictatorship because when the Acto Institucional Número Cinco was decreed in 1968, um, it did away with uh, constitutional um, liberties like the, the freedom to gather in groups, mm. but to gather yeah. in groups with a political motive. And of course, this, these were spontaneous gatherings around some street vendor or some street performer. And, yeah. and she was very much fascinated by these spaces. Um, and so you see here again, there she's drawing and making these collages uh, around them, but also working with these sort of uh, like blobs of color that, yeah. And turn up in the in the Tupinamba. So here and again another um, some other stills from the from the magnetized spaces uh, films. Mm -hmm. Someone else added that um, I've spent time in Brazil in Manas and in the Amazon. The Tetela works reminded me of the light shafts coming through and deep in forests, magical light, almost godly. So kind of underscoring that reading of the, of the installation. Um, Monica Majoli asks us, how do you both see the use of the theatrical tropes of the horror genre in this body of work? 
There's a way that the intensity of the materials, color, epic scale of the work is viscerally complex, which seems contradicted by the clear artifice of the horror aesthetic that Pape is employing. Well, uh, it's an interesting question, also giving the LA cinematographic context. Yeah. Um, she uh, actually, Lisa Pup participated in a, um, in a vampire film <laughs> with uh, that uh, of, um, made by Antonio Manuel yeah. um, in the 70s. And uh, she also appears in another work of, of Antonio Manuel with these fans. Um, <laughs> So there is this whole idea, and, and this film has a lot of sort of B-series uh, quality to it. Um, hmm. That's funny that Marisa Mertz at the same, well, in 68, she makes a horror film too, uh, or is participates in a horror film and her sculpture, the living sculpture, which is similarly kind of has this grotesque uh, monumentality to it uh, is the prop is the main kind of thing in the in the film. Antonio Diaz. Now I, I get like. Um, oh, Antonio Diaz. Yeah. 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 And the lighting, I I don't, I don't know if the lighting, which is part of you know the kind of reading of horror in it, I suppose. I wonder. I don't know if the lighting was her original intention. I imagine it must have been. I'm sure that that was honored, but that certainly underscores the kind of feeling of the horror film in there. Well, I said it all wrong. It was actually Lija's film, this one Tiro. She uh -huh. made the entire film in 70. Wow. But it's a part of a moment where she's collaborating with Antonio Manuel a lot. And uh, Antonio actually also makes this one of his um, clandestinas. Lija appears as a vampire there. Uh -huh. so, you know, they're playing with that trope around that time in Brazil. And of course, it's a scary time. It's a time when uh, there was censorship. Um, and they're really going around this whole idea, um, sort of subver subverting this censorship by alluding to this idea of horror in, in the camp horror film. Mm -hmm. um, so any, any other questions? Yeah. Oh. One more, Miki Suzuki asks, why did she combine indigenous people's elements and furniture, which we talked about a little bit, and any meaning of the placement of the breasts? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think the furniture is necessarily uh, of the indigenous people. No, not, not absolutely yeah. not. I think it's the, this ju juxtaposition that he make, that she makes. Um, but also, I think she's also um, speaking about um, that these objects generate this kind of strangeness because it's a familiar object. It's an object that for you in your cult, in Western cultures, are these are objects that are everyday objects. And suddenly when you're seeing them covered in feathers and with these uh, limbs or breasts protruding from them, they generate this confusion as to what they may represent. They create this idea of this, this estrangement, this uh, mm. A effect to use the Brechtian term, you know, and they, are, they become these unsettling objects, but that produce may perhaps uh, or render visible this, this, the, these repressed histories, um, this idea that the month of Tupinamba no longer even no, no longer exists, no longer exists in Brazil. Uh, that this anthropophagic impulse is also still very much alive among these artists. So I think there's many, many readings, but I think it's really an act of rendering the object unfamiliar. It's an act of defamiliarization, of creating an uncanny experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, your question? Okay. I think there are no more questions and um, maybe that's a good place to, to bring it to a close. The, the experience of the whole thing is so uncanny. I was even thinking, I mean, seeing it in Los Angeles, it's, it reminded me of things I've never seen, but only known historically, you know, of woman house and these, these uh, uh, 
installations that have happened here over time by other incredible women artists. Um, but it's such a great show and, and uh, yeah, I guess we'll bring it to a close and um, thank you, Julieta. It's such a pleasure to hear from you about this work. No, thank you. And thank you, Hauser and Worth and Olivier and Russell and everyone who's collaborated to make this possible. I wish I could have seen the show, but you know. <laughs> well, you wrote a beautiful text so we can, we can read that eventually, we hope. Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you. We'll thank bring you. it to a close. Thank you. Thank you.